One time I hallucinated there was a minor 49er uh, sitting across the road from me. He had a big gray beard and you know overalls on. And I noticed he's got a gold pan and he holds out the gold pan to me and he says, water, water, I need water. Hi, it's Dean Carnassus, author and ultra marathoner. And this is ultra marathon support. From Flamingo Cat. How on earth do you eat and run without upchucking? Or do you walk and eat? You do both. You run and eat and walk and eat. I eat a lot of food while I'm running. And a lot of ultra marathoners do because you don't want to slow down. It's always about relentless forward progress. I'll be honest, sometimes you know you, you do upchuck. It's not normal and you try not to upchuck because upchucking can create electrolyte imbalances. Most of the time the food stays down just fine, but depending on the temperature and the duration, you know, upchucking can be a problem. So the next question is from Zizzo Group. Do ultra marathon runners pee their pants during a run? Not if you're good at it. I don't get any on my shoes. Yes, I pee while I run, but not in my pants. That begs the question, how do you do it? Literally just kind of turn sideways and you waddle like a, like a penguin and I'm expert at it. I don't even get a drop on my shoes. How do runners deal with nipple chafing? And that's a really good question. There is a product called Nipple Ease, believe it or not. It's like a little round Band-Aid. There's nothing actually touching your nipple, but there's a like a barrier in front of it. Next question is from L.E. Black Sheep. Why, why, why is it such a pain to get breathing technique right when running? That's another good question. I've been experimenting with, with nose breathing at a shorter distance, like a 10K, only breathing through my nose. And what I found is <laughs> it really sucks, but it gets you into very good shape. My friend Bart Yasso, who's a guy I, I greatly admire, you know, Bart says, I breathe through my nose, I breathe through my mouth, I breathe through any way I can get air in my lungs. So I think it's very much a, a personal choice how you breathe, whether you breathe through your mouth or through your nose. But I would encourage you to try nose breathing, see if that works for you. If not, um, breathe through your mouth as well. So this next question is from Fionn. How in the world did Dean Carnassus run for 24 hours? Well, it gets better than that. I, I ran for 24 hours on a treadmill on a two-story platform hoisted above Times Square with all the jumbotrons filming me as I did this 24-hour run. And as you can imagine, it was quite dizzying, not only being on a treadmill for 24 hours, but being up in the air trying to complete this ultra marathon. And it was all for a very good cause. It was a fundraiser for prostate cancer. So it felt worthwhile. And I think in the end, I covered about 148 miles, but I didn't move a single step forward. It's crazy. It's ludicrous to be saying this, but I've actually run for 48 hours on a treadmill as well. But that's not the longest I've ever run. I've run for 81 hours, and that was over the course of 350 miles. You know, I, I think it was the very last step I actually had, and 350 miles about killed me. So next up is Kayla with a C at Ock Wordy. I have a serious question. How do runners control their BMs for hours on end of running? We carry toilet paper. <laughs> That's a simple answer. We look for a strategic bush to hide behind and typically dig a little hole, you do your thing. And sometimes I even carry a little bag and kind of pick it up like a, like a dog poop. Amber asks, why do they give out belt buckles at ultra marathons? Just curious. The legend is that the 100 mile trail race began as a horse race. And one year a gentleman was training to do this 100 mile horse race and his horse came up lame three days before the start, but he still wanted to do the race and he announced, I'm just gonna run it. And they thought he was crazy, but they let him do the horse race on foot and he somehow finished the race. And when he got to the finish line, they didn't have typical race medals because this is a horse race, but they did have rodeo style belt buckles. So they said, let's just give him one of those. So here is a very celebrated Western States 100 mile endurance run silver buckle. When you finish the race 10 times in under 24 hours each, uh, you get one of these special buckles. Mike asks, it's very easy to get discouraged after taking a long break from running. How do you get motivated to get after it? That's a really good question. And I empathize with you because it is very difficult to get motivated to restart. I always suggest investing in a good pair of shoes. Footwear technology has advanced so much in the past three or four years. So part of what's gonna motivate you is that if those shoes sit idle in your closet, you're gonna feel so guilty you didn't put them to use. And then I would say, Five to six months down the road, sign up for a race. I would say a half marathon or a, or a marathon. Tell your friends about it. You know, send out an email blast saying, hey, I'm gonna do this, this half marathon and I'm gonna do it for charity. So will you support me? And once people are supporting you, you know, you're kind of on the hook. And then 
ramp up your training slowly. And realize that it's baby steps. It's much easier to get out of shape than it is to get back into shape. II Sav X, how can I run faster? And the answer is run faster. <laughs> and what tends to happen is when we go out for a run or a workout, we push to our max. You hit a plateau. I recommend the hard, easy technique. So one day go really, really hard, running as fast as you can. The next day, slow down your pace. Go a little bit further, but slower. But you've got to run really fast beyond you know your typical pace to be able to improve beyond the plateau. Also, I would recommend quantifying your workouts. You can see here I have a, a smartwatch on. I like to look at a lot of different data from my run uh, just to see how the improvements are coming along or not coming along and making adjustments based on that data. Scott Johnson asks, what's the best way to carb load before an ultra marathon? And my answer is don't. <laughs> I do not carb load and I do not recommend carb loading. I used to carb load a lot and inevitably I show up the next morning at the start of the race bloated from carb loading the night before. So I recommend just having a normal meal the night before uh, a race. I would also suggest avoiding a lot of dietary fiber for obvious reasons, especially insoluble fiber before a race. Insoluble fiber makes you regular, but during a race, you don't wanna be regular. <laughs> the idea behind carb loading was to improve your muscle glycogen stores. So your muscles only store a certain amount of carbohydrates, it's called glycogen. And the theory was if you ate more carbohydrates, you'd store more glycogen. Uh, but the problem is, that's not always the case. And the other problem is that you store a lot of water when you carb load, so you end up feeling bloated. So the next question comes from Lisa Bardelt. How did you get started? I assume no one becomes an ultra marathoner overnight. Well, I'll tell you my, my backstory. I walked out of a bar on my 30th birthday and decided that night I was gonna run 30 miles. And my friends thought I was crazy. They said, let's have another round of tequila to celebrate your 30th birthday. And I said, no, I'm, I'm gonna run 30 miles instead. And at midnight, I left the bar and I'll never forget, I didn't own running gear, but I had on these, these comfortable silk boxer shorts, these silk underwear. So I peeled off my pants and threw them down the alleyway. I lived in San Francisco at the time and I knew there was a city called Half Moon Bay that was 30 miles away and I thought, just run to Half Moon Bay. And about 15 miles into it, I sobered up and I thought, what am I doing? This is crazy, but it just felt right. And the other thing is that, you know, I was out in the middle of nowhere at this point, so there's nowhere to go but forward. Turning around would have been another 15 miles to get back. So that night I made it 30 miles. It wasn't pretty. There was some, you know, some blistering and some chafing where the sun don't shine. It forever changed the course of my life. And after that, I became an ultra marathoner. Hannah asks, what do y'all think about during a run? mundane stuff or big ideas or how much you just want to die. I think you think of all of those things. You know, when I'm running an ultra marathon or a long distance, I think of everything and nothing. Many runners, that's why we love what we do is because your mind is free to wander. You know, you're kind of a captive audience of one. And sometimes I think about big issues. Other times I think about just taking my next step. When things get really difficult, I try to turn off the mind and not think at all and just put one foot in front of the other to the best of my ability. The other thing I do a lot of when I'm running is writing. So I've written five books and I do a lot of writing on the run. Gilly Gilly, how do runners find their second wind when I can't even find my first wind? <laughs> Sometimes I have a hard time finding my first wind as well, but I would say push through it. Uh, you know, perseverance. A lot of it just comes down to grunt work. Uh, don't be afraid to walk. If you have to walk, take a walk break, but keep going. The important thing is that you keep pushing and it will get easier. There's all kinds of theories why energy, you know, comes in waves. Something called the central governor theory, which is your mind regulates it all. There's theories where your body basically physiologically tells your mind to slow down because, you know, you're getting into the red zone. But a lot of it, I think, is very subjective. You know, during an ultra marathon, you might go through a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth, and tenth wind. Uh, you're constantly kind of hitting the wall. You're out of gas and you're out of breath. And if you can push through it, you have some renewed energy and can keep going. You run when you can. You walk if you have to. You crawl if you must. You just never give up. So the next question is from Ben Schlong, the fantasy flyer. How do you train for an ultra marathon when the joints are saying no? The hashtag is aging. Well, I feel you there, Ben. I'm, I'm no uh, spring chicken myself. But one thing I would recommend is cross training. To me, the big secret staying injury free 
and pain-free is cross training. So I do a lot of training with my leg strength and also my upper body strength. I'd also say, you know, your diet is very important. So boosting the omega-3 fatty acids from, you know, fatty seafoods is one way to, um, you know, keep your joints lubricated. So one tool you might want to incorporate for your recovery is something called a percussion gun. It hammers your muscle. A lot of runners and ultra marathoners use these not only in between races for recovery, but actually on the course. They might come into an aid station, and have their crew member there, just take it usually to their quadriceps or to their calves. I'm in my 50s now. I still run ultra marathons and 100 mile or further ultra marathons. And I'm not the only one. There are other people in their 50s, 60s, even 70s that are running ultra marathons. So I don't think we have a limited number of foot strikes in our life. I think it just comes down to the individual and training. But I really believe that anyone can run an ultra marathon and they can keep running ultra marathons even as they age at go run with me. I love that handle. How do you fuel up during an ultra marathon? Looking at nutrition options for big races. I would say, listen to everyone, follow no one, Jessica. You have to find what works best for you. So experiment during your training run. You know, for me, I use a product called Heed by Hammer Nutrition, which is a scientifically engineered energy drink. I also use, you know, gels, uh, energy bars, I also personally like uh, nut butters. So it's a, nut butters are a very concentrated source of calories. One element of ultra marathon, especially during hot ultra marathons is hydration. So staying well hydrated and maintaining your electrolyte balance is, is very important. Not only do I, you know, we drink a lot of water, but we also uh, drink electrolyte replenishment beverages that also have a source of carbohydrates, of complex carbohydrates, not simple sugars. The product I use, to stay hydrated as well is called Endurolytes. It's like a salt capsule, but it has magnesium, potassium, chloride, and Endurolytes also have ginger powder, which helps settle your stomach. So I would experiment with using either S-caps or uh, Endurolytes to see how they help you maintain your electrolyte balance. Yeah, so during a typical ultra marathon, we wear what are called hydration packs. They have pouches and packs where you can store these things during your run. They also have some pockets in the front, and that's how you can grab these things on the run. The first time I tried to run the Badwater Ultra Marathon, which is a 135 mile race across Death Valley in the middle of summer, I became extremely dehydrated and I threw my electrolytes out of balance. And at about mile 75 at 2 a.m., I passed out on the side of the road. And my crew was driving all around the desert looking for me, and they saw two shoes sticking out of a bush, and they literally picked me up and they carried me to the car and they drove me three hours to the nearest hotel and I fell asleep for eight hours. <laughs> and that's how my first ultra marathon ended. And you know, I've had some really vivid hallucinations. I've hallucinated there were dinosaurs off in the distance. And, and one time I hallucinated there was a minor 49er uh, sitting across the road from me. He had a big gray beard and you know overalls on. And I noticed he's got a gold pan and he holds out the gold pan to me and he says, water water, I need water. And I was carrying a handheld water bottle, so I aspirated it in his gold pan, and I heard the water sizzling on the pavement, and I reached out to touch him, and my hand went right through him, and I thought, he's not real, that was a hallucination. So the next question is from John Molkeen. Question for runners, what's the etiquette when you're out running and you're approaching another person in front? You trip them. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding, John. Do what feels natural to you. Uh, some runners prefer just to keep their head down and run past another runner. Uh, others like to to wave or you know at least acknowledge the other runner. Some like to give high fives. So do whatever feels right for you and you really can't do anything wrong giving another runner some love. So the next question is from Julie Grows. Why does the same distance and time feel so different on different days? And how do you deal with those runs when you just feel terrible? And that's a really good question. It might have to do with your state of recovery or even your sleep. Sometimes if you get a bad night's sleep, the next day running cannot feel as good as the previous day. It might also be your psychological state. You know, if you're on a downer, if you will, sometimes you, your body just responds accordingly. Just the opposite is true. Sometimes when you're just in an upbeat mood, you have some of the best runs ever. It's just little subtle things that can play a big role in how you feel during a run. So the next question is from Misha Gurevich. How do ultra marathon runners not get bored? Do they listen to podcasts? I listen to audiobooks actually. I've got over 500 audiobooks on my playlist. So I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Sometimes I just tune out and listen to the beating of my heart. 
But those are all the questions for today. You really asked some quirky and some interesting questions. So I learned a lot and I hope you did as well.